Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hey, everybody. Thanks uh, for coming out tonight. Thank you to Rocco, the city of Evanston, Jumpstart, Evanston for putting this on. Um, I'm Jason Bailey. I'm with CWG. We're a marketing agency. Uh, this actually here in town. And uh, Rocco asked me tonight to talk to you guys about marketing and creating a marketing plan. So we're going to go through a few things tonight. Hopefully you guys get some value out of it and it helps you guys get off on the right foot when it comes to building your marketing and thinking about your marketing for your business. Uh, I've got a lot to cover. And I've been known to ramble. So I'm going to try to get through all this as fast as I can and leave a little bit of time at the end for any kind of like Q&A stuff. So if you guys have questions, we can talk about that. Or if you want to talk about specifics with your business, I'm more than happy to do that. I'll also stick around for a couple minutes afterwards. So if you want to come see me and talk to me, okay? Um, so today we're going to talk, well, I'm going to introduce myself a little bit more in my company, CWG, and then we'll talk about basically how to build a marketing plan, the fundamentals of a marketing plan, um, and kind of start going through all the pieces you need to start thinking about in order to get your marketing set up and aligned. One of the biggest problems I see happen when people come to me is people jump into marketing without putting a plan in place. And they basically throw out a random number and say, I have this much money to spend on marketing and I do it. And then they come and go, it didn't work. Um, and they're really surprised by it. And I hear that all the time. Uh, I'll hear it when we pitch people, they'll say, oh, you know what? We've tried SEO in the past and it just doesn't work for us. And if you do a little digging, you find out it doesn't work because they just didn't set it up right. Or the, the agency or consultant or whoever they hired or went to didn't set up right. And that's really where that first pain point is, is they're not going into it, asking the right questions, creating the right set of um, criteria for their marketing campaign. They're just kind of throwing things blindfolded at a dartboard, hoping something sticks. And I want to try to help you all avoid that pitfall, okay, today. Okay, so this, I have some handouts, but um, anyone here familiar with Murphy's Law? Anybody? Everybody? Okay. Right? So I'm Irish, so I think it double impact me is hard when it happens. And so my printer decided to get possessed and stop printing, and it was nonsensical. So this is a QR code. You can scan it with your phone and it will pull up a PDF file of a whole bunch of what I was hoping to be handouts for you guys tonight, but that you can um, download and actually fill out to help you guys set up your own marketing plan. Hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Uh -huh. No. Uh -huh. What's that? Murphy is an option. Okay. All right. I like that. Um, okay. So, yeah, you can you can download them. They're on my my server. I think Rock is going to put them up on on your website or whatever as well. So you'll be able to get them from there. Um, they're just a number of templates is all they are that will help you guys to start going through this and building this plan because it can get overwhelming. Okay. If uh, you want a physical copy at the end of this, I've got like four or five that made it out alive. Um, I'm more than happy to give them to you. Or you can come to my office tomorrow, and if I haven't destroyed the printer with a sledgehammer, I will print out some more, I promise. And, and you can get one a physical copy from me there, okay? All right. So, as I said, my name is Jason. My company is CWG. We're a full service advertising, marketing, and web design agency. Uh, we like to say our tagline is small agency, big results. Um, we're actually located here in Evanston, uh, have been for about four years now. Uh, originally founded in Phoenix, Arizona. And that's, um, I guess, that's kind of where I'm from. It's where I went to college and spent the last 20 some years of my life. So, um, my background is I started out in sales. So I kind of I went to college, didn't know what I was going to do, dropped out, got into sales, um, ended up getting a chance to work in the sales department. So some really 
um, big companies that had some really good sales training programs like Xerox and Canon and Toshiba, where I learned a lot. But what I found was I gravitated to a lot of the pre-sale prospects, a lot of the interaction with customers who didn't know who we were or what we were doing, which is more marketing side of things. So from there, I transitioned into marketing roles, realized I needed to go back to school if I really wanted to do this seriously. Um, went back to school. I have degrees in marketing and communication. My wife is Erica. She's my partner um, in the business and in life. But uh, she has an MBA with a focus on organizational behavior and consumer psychology. And so about 15 years ago, well, actually 2008, uh, when the last big recession had hit, um, Phoenix got hit really hard because it was very housing and tourism dependent economy. And we were both looking down the barrel of layoffs. Like it was coming every day. People were getting exiting the offices and we were going, what's going to happen to us? What's going to happen? And uh, we were sitting around the dinner table talking one day and we realized we have together have these skills that we can share with businesses out there, especially small businesses who can't afford to hire Madison Avenue style agencies, right? The big New York agency that worked with Coca-Cola and Delta and so forth. Um, so why don't we try to open our own agency? It was insane and crazy. We had zero dollars. It was a recession. Businesses were going out left and right, but we did it anyway. And somehow 15, 16 years later, we're still here. Um, haven't killed each other and have grown and done some pretty cool things with some pretty cool companies. So that's kind of our story. Uh, I don't really don't want to talk too much about myself, but we, you know, we do advertising, marketing, websites, social media, all that kind of fun stuff, right? And uh, the last thing I'll say about that is everybody asks me why Evanston? Like, why why did you guys move to Evanston? Why do you have a marketing advertising agency in Evanston? Um, the reality is I grew up in Utah, so on the other side of the border, I went down to go to Arizona State for school. Um, that's where I met my wife, got married, had kids, started a family, and spent the past 20 years there. Well, my parents live out in Bear River, and so every year we'd send the kids up for summer to hang out um, where it's a little bit cooler and they can go outside without worrying about getting run over or, you know, burning to death. Um, and uh, my middle son kept saying every time he'd come home, he goes, hey, when are we going to move to the ranch? That's what they called it. Guys, when are we going to move to the ranch? When are we going to move to the ranch? So when my oldest two graduated high school, we kind of found ourselves in a position where we just put our house on the market. We wanted to relocate weren't sure where or what my son said, what are we going to move to the ranch? And we went literally on a whim. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so we started looking up houses for sale in Evanston, uh, put together a list, called the uh, realtor. The next weekend we drove up, made an offer on a house and 30 days later we were here. So that's kind of how I ended up in Evanston. I'm happy to be here. I love it here. I wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, the big city in the heat, they can all, they can keep it as far as that goes. But there you go. There's the why I'm in Evanston question everyone asked me. Um, all right. So let's start with uh, kind of the most important question of what is marketing? So the textbook definition is the activity for, of our business of promoting and selling products or services, including market research and advertising. That is a great textbook definition entirely wrong it's outdated um and it really promotes marketing as a one-way street which it's not marketing is about engaging in a dialogue with your consumers so if you let me explain here's kind of how that works yesterday's marketing was entirely based on what we call push methods which means i have a message i want to share with you and i'm going to push that message out to you whether you're willing or wanted or not right um, I'm, I'm going to push my message on you, but it's very one way. I'm telling you what to do. Uh, so those would be things that we still use them today, but those push methods are things like advertisements, radio spots, magazines, uh, newspaper ads, right? Those are all examples of push method advertising or push method marketing. Um, the reason this worked is 40 years ago, if you wanted to buy a car, your choice was to go down to the local dealership, see what they had in stock and pick one, right? So you bought your vehicle based upon what the advertisers and the dealership told you they wanted you to do. Those were your options. 
Uh, there wasn't an internet then. There wasn't Carvana. There wasn't hard delivery to your front door. You know, none of that stuff existed. So you as a consumer at that point had really not much say in how you were going to engage other than I need a car, right? Um, basically, the advertisers controlled the narrative. They created the demand. They created the expectations of what you were going to get. And you kind of just had to deal with that. So today's marketing is absolutely not that way. Today's marketing is about engaging in a two-way conversation with the consumer to create changes based on the market needs. Um, consumers today are empowered. They hold the keys to the kingdom. They control the narrative. Okay? Uh, your, how your audience views your product is very largely going to be dependent on what their peers say. So we're talking platforms like Yelp, Google, social media, right? They all, they all form our perspective of a brand and how we interact with it and engage with it, even if we haven't purchased from them before. Basically, this stuff all gives a voice that's more powerful to the consumer than the advertiser's voice. So we can't yell at people and tell them, this is what you're going to do, this is what we want you to do. We have to now listen to what they're saying and try to fit ourselves into that process. So I think the, the biggest takeaway from this is listen, engage in conversations with an the attempt or expectation to solve a problem, right? Not to tell somebody what to do, but to solve a problem they're having. If you can do that, if you can unlock what is their problem and how does my product or service solve that problem, your, your job of marketing is going to become 100 times easier and 100 times more successful. So to illustrate that, let's talk about the Stanley Cup and not the one that my coyotes never made ever, um, but this Stanley Cup, right? Um, raise your hand if you've seen this in the news lately or know what this is about. Uh, like almost everybody. Okay, so Stanley's been around a long time. It was founded in 1913. Um, mostly it's known in the blue collar community, right? For like their thermoses. They're, they're rough, they're rugged, they keep your coffee or your soup warm while you're out there in the fields. That's Stanley's background. But all of a sudden now everybody's really thirsty for Stanley's cups here. Um, and it's, it, it's bonkers, it's a crazy, story because Stanley's never even tried to be what we call a lifestyle brand, meaning like Nike is a lifestyle brand, right? If I wear Nike, it means some, I'm saying something about my values and what I mean. That was never Stanley's motivation. But what happened was basically Stanley created this 40 ounce tumbler in like 2014 or something, and they did not sell at all. Nobody wanted them, nobody bought them. Um, so then in 2020, a uh, social media influencer named Emily Maynard Johnson, who apparently was on The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, on her podcast, had her Stanley Cup that she had found that she bought because it fit exactly perfectly right in her cup holder of her car. And that's why she bought it, because she wanted to drink a lot of water. They were super big, and it fit in the cup holder. But she had it on her podcast, and someone noticed it, asked her a question about it. She started talking about it. One of the executives of Stanley was pretty smart. It caught their attention. They basically reached out to her and said, how about we uh, form a partnership and, uh, you know, you pitch our, our mugs here for us, um, which she did. And once they had that campaign set up, Stanley completely sold out within five days of something they could not move. Okay. Um, and now it's gone to the point where it's so crazy that, like, women are fighting each other in Target to get a hold of one when they come in stock. It's, it's bonkers ridiculous. But it's a good illustration of how a brand listened to what the audience wanted, what was important to people, <laughs> engaged with that, and it opened up an entirely new revenue stream for them. So that's what we want to do. That's what we're trying to do here. Is it going to play? No, it's not. That sucks. Well, I have this cool little uh, video clip, but it doesn't want to play. Um, Remember, as kids, 
Okay, I've seen this movie, The Big Hero Six. All right, so in this scene that I was going to play, basically, this kid is trying to get into a super pet nerdy college that his brother goes to, and he has to basically come up with a concept or an idea to impress the admissions panel, right? And win this challenge, and he's stuck. He can't think of anything. So his brother picks him up, flings him upside down, holds him by his ankles and shakes him, and he's like, what are you doing? And his brother says, uh, I'm shaking things up, and I'm helping you to find a new angle. Okay, That's what I want to do with marketing today. <laughs> All right? That's what I want you guys to take away from this, is we're going to find an entirely new angle to go about building a marketing plan. Like I had said uh, kind of earlier, um, I hear a lot of marketing doesn't work uh, all the time from people. I hear it from people that I just meet and network with at events like this where they go, oh, yeah, it doesn't work. You guys are charlatans, basically. Um, fine, that's fair. Uh, I also hear marketing doesn't work because we did X and we spent X on Y and got nothing out of it. And so that means marketing doesn't work. Um, the common component to all of this is people were going about it the wrong way, the old way, and the way a lot of agencies like mine want you to go about marketing, which is basically they were saying, I need to get some customers. I'm going to have to spend some money to do that. I guess I can throw a thousand dollars at something. What, what do you suggest I do? And I go, yeah, I'll take a thousand dollars. Sure, and we'll do this. And we run a half-hearted campaign on something. It doesn't generate the results. Customer goes, all right. Well, I'm out of my thousand dollars. And the agency goes, okay. Well, we're on to another customer anyway. Another client. You don't have any money left, right? And then marketing doesn't work. So all we need to do is we need to turn that on its head. We need to figure out how to create marketing plans that fit into the market and generate sales. Right? That's our goal. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We want to start at the very end of the campaign, not at the beginning, not where everybody else has started. So I, and this is on the internet too, which kind of sucks, but I'm going to share a big time failure with you that recently just happened with me. Okay. So I had a company come to me. They basically, I don't want to drop names or do too, but basically what they do is they, to guided sourcing trips to third world or countries, you know, for manufacturing. So um, if you want to go to China or Vietnam or India or something like that, to set up a relationship with manufacturers so you can get product direct from manufacturers to your storefront, your Amazon store, whatever, they basically act as your host and take you through the whole process and introduce you and translate and do all those kind of things. Um, pretty new startup. They have a partner overseas that they're working with who's established but they're a pretty new startup so they came to us and they said hey guys we need some marketing we got a big event coming up to india in april i think it's march or april here um what can you do and this was in december and we said wow that's not a lot of time for a high ticket item like we're talking by high ticket i mean their average sales five to seven thousand dollars that's what caught you to go on one of these tours um, so we're like, that's not a lot of time to put together a campaign for a high ticket item, but we can try. What do you guys have now? We have nothing. Okay. How are you finding leads right now? Well, we're just talking to people. Like we're going to events like the one they met us at, similar to this. And we're just talking to people and we're like, okay, what is it you like think we can help you with? What do you want us to help you with? And they said, well, we just need some advertising. So like Facebook ads, stuff like that. So we talked to them a little bit. We set up a really quick funnel, which is, we'll get into that, but it's just a sequence of how we bring somebody through, a customer through a journey to ultimately get them to an outcome to a set, how we introduce them to our company. Set up a really quick funnel for them with a web page, landing page, some social media posts, some advertisements, and a couple of emails in the sequence. Um, we told them in the first 60 days, it would basically be all set up, meaning it would take us 60 days to get their campaign up and running, seeing how we had, we were starting at point zero. That's how long my agency needed to start making them money or start getting them what we call market penetration. 
So 45 days into the campaign, we get on the phone with them. We've got the web page, landing page built. We've got emails templated out. We've got some social media going. And we're like, hey, guys, like, we've done all the legwork. Everything's going smooth. We're ready to start going. And they go, yeah, we didn't realize it was going to be this much money. And uh, like it was a monthly retainer. And they're like, we thought it was just one time that we were paying you. And um, we really haven't seen any results yet. So we talked to them about it and said, okay, we told you it take 60 days to get the campaign up and running, and then we can start actually measuring results. And they said, well, we internally thought we would have at least 15 sales within the first 30 days. They never shared this with us. Had they shared this with us, I would have said, hey, probably there's nothing we can do to help you. Please do not hand me your money. Um, or B, we would have went straight into like hardcore advertising type thing into just a checkout process. We wouldn't have put a page up. We wouldn't have uh, people what they did. We would have played a numbers game instead of an education game and just focused on driving the volume to hopefully capture a lower percentage point. But because they didn't share these goals with us, they didn't, we never really defined what would be success in both their eyes and our eyes and jointly on this campaign. We just rushed to get things out. It didn't work, right? And a month and a half into it, it fell apart. I lost a bunch of money because all of my expenses were front loaded for my team to do all the work. They lost money because they paid us money and didn't really get much out of it, right? Um, and so nobody stopped to say, like, how are we going to measure this? How are we going to define what's success? So that really becomes the question we started asking is, how do we know if we succeeded with our marketing if we never bothered to define success? Right? Go back to what I first said. Most people, they set a budget, they say, I need customers, and they throw it out there. And that's how they build a marketing plan but they don't know whether it's success or not until after it's all over and they go back. And by then, there could be a hundred different factors of what I defined as a success or not that weren't relevant to the original campaign. So what I'm gonna share with you today is kind of our new top secret strategy for how to crush your marketing campaign. And it really is just starting at the end and reverse engineering your way through the entire campaign. I know it sounds crazy, but it's totally awesome. It's worked for us ever since then. Um, all right. So first off, it's all about focus. Okay. If you're not crystal clear on what your goals are for your marketing dollar, you're flying blind. Okay. Uh, it's sort of like trying to win a, a race without knowing exactly where the finish line is. You're just going to start running until you drop, and then you're going to go like, did I do good? Or, you know what I mean? Did I make it a quarter mile? I don't know. Um, so we've got to set up the targets up front, so we've kind of got a roadmap. We call those KPIs, or key performance indicators, right? Those are basically benchmarks we utilize to determine if our campaign's on track, if it's successful or not. Okay, so when you start at the end, then success becomes crystal clear because you know exactly what you need to do to make your campaign a home run. And that kind of clarity is going to fuel your hustle, your focus, and your efforts, and you're not going to waste energy on a bunch of stuff that doesn't work. And that's the coolest part of this is you can quickly identify when something isn't working, isn't paying off, and dump it. All right, so we're going to spot weaknesses. We're going to spot failures. Um, it's basically an agile mindset. We're constantly going to tweak and refine this thing until it's bulletproof. And uh, like I said, it, it gives you kind of the opportunity to pivot early to save yourself time and money. So all that being said, how do we start at the end? Well, we just start by setting some goals. Okay. So this was be one of the handouts. So when you download it, this is what it looked like. And um, I apologize for the very, very bright highlighter green color. It is more of a candy apple green on my computer, and that's our brand color. That looks like somebody vomited something from the top waistline. But anyway, you'll get you'll get this. Uh, 
What was that? It's easy to see. Well, that's a good thing, at least. There we go. All right, so we're just going to set some goals. But what I want is I don't want our goals to just be generic, and I don't want our goals to not have a timetable associated with them, right? We need to be able to accurately measure these and find out what they're going to be. So what I want everybody to do is set a 30-day goal, a 90-day goal, and a one-year goal for their business. And I apologize if I cough and hack a little bit. I'm not contagious, but I'm just getting over something. Um, all right, so these are going to be like your big idea goals. You do not need to get too detailed at this stage. Um, basically, it could be, if you're already an established business, it could be like, I want to increase revenue by 20% within 90 days, right? Uh, it could be, I want to add 10 new customers or 100 new customers, or I want to sell 1,000 units. Um, it doesn't matter what it is. Like I said, it's this is kind of big picture stuff. But I want a goal for 30 days, I want a goal for 90 days, and I want a goal for a year. Because we're going to base everything we do on those numbers right there. Okay? So, I had handouts. And this probably won't work for me either. Oh, you know what? I put there. Yeah, there we go. All right. Um, thank you. So, when I had handouts, I was going to have you guys take four minutes to define those three goals. I see most of you have paper, so I'm going to make you do it anyway. So, it's audience participation time. All right. So, give me a 30 day goal, a 60 day goal, and a 90 day goal for your business. Make them real. Don't say things like just like, I want to grow or I want to survive. Like, you know, give me something that's actionable, but come up with something for each of those. Okay. And I'll give you, I'll give you three minutes here to do that. Actually, I'm only going to give you two because like I said, I tend to run behind. What's up? Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Sure. And in your case, you may want like a 30 day goal to be um, more focused on things that you can do to set yourself up for future success, uh, like finding new car shows or, you know, events that you can go to or prepping materials for that. In which case, it's kind of hard to use those as like your tangible, your KPI, your tangible outcomes on the goals. But in that situation, if it's a seasonal business or something like that, I would say focus on more the long term, the one year goal, because your marketing campaigns are going to be a lot longer drawn out anyway, because there's no reason for you to run a 30 day market. Like there's really no reason for you to focus on the next 30 days unless you have a show or something coming up because, you know. They're not. Another thing that I see a lot with companies that are seasonal business or contingent upon things like that, like shows, um, trade shows, and, and that's how they market primarily, is yeah, about creating follow-up campaigns. Like we call them drip campaigns, but email drip campaigns. So I go to this event, right? And there's all these people there. Um, I'm getting in contact with a lot of people. But if I leave the event and they don't reach out to me, it's just poop. It's gone. It's over with, right? So what we need to do is create what's called a drip campaign, which is basically a way for me to stay in constant contact with them. Even if I know they're not going to be ready to buy now or in the next two months or three months or six months, I know I'll probably see them in the next part of six months, right? They're, they're one of the people who are most likely to be there. I want my name and my brand to be in front of them continually for that six-month period. So when I see them again, it's I can move them through what we call that funnel and down that sales cycle, closer to a sale rather than restart at that introductory phase, right? Where it's like, this is who I am and this is what we do and these are the broad stroke overviews of our company. Like, what are about us? I want them to learn. I want them to know. Uh, it's all that. How do I seem to get in contact? That's what you're going to ask anyway. It's fish bowls. Shows like that. Fish bowls are amazing at shows like that. So it's like literally, um, if it's B2B, then we usually say throw your business card in, right? But if it's not B2B, I would have little tags printed out or something. People can write their name, phone number. I mean, 
they do it all the time when you go to like a sporting event, right? They're giving away t-shirts or tickets to, you know, the upcoming game or something. And they've got little cards there and you fill it out. You put in your name and your phone number and your address and you put it in the fishbowl. You know what I mean? Or you get a chance to spin the wheel or something like that. What you're doing is you are giving them your information so that they can initiate a marketing campaign onto you. Is literally what you're doing. Now, the trade-off from that is it's, it's an equity exchange. So like we guard our personal information because we know people are going to use it, right? You know that if you give me your email address today, I'm probably going to send you an email that you don't want. You know what I mean? You don't want me being like, hey, it's Jason, we met at Jumpstart Evanston, and I just want to know what you're doing for your marketing, and I'd love to set up a 10-minute call with you to discuss my services. You don't want that email. So you're not going to give it to me if I just say, hey, give me your email, right? But if I'm like, give me your email and you can win this iPad, well, hey, I'll put up with you bagging me for a little bit until I finally click that unsubscribe button or listen to what you have to say. If I have a damn win an iPad out of it, like for sure, you know what I mean? That's worth it to me. So that's how we collect data um, at, at events like that, is we find something that's relevant to that event and that audience, something they value. Um, we work that cost into our marketing campaign. So, you know, it could be small things like a t-shirt or, you know, like if you manufacture car wax, it could just be a bottle of car wax, you know, or something like that that we're giving away. And then in return, now I'm going to start marketing to you to actually buy my products. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So what you want to do is you want to stay away from your offer initially on that because that's and we're going to get into that stuff. But that's called what we call an awareness stage. So at the awareness stage, they don't know who you are. They're meeting you for the first time and learning about you and your product for the first time. So they don't have an interest or a desire to work with you. Now sometimes this can move really fast because. Um, there are really short life cycles in marketing and there are really long life cycles depending on the product and so forth. Um, so without knowing your specifics, I can't say, you know what I mean? Like, oh yeah. But most of the time when someone's in an awareness phase, they don't know you exist. You're actually trying to pull them in to your orbit and your universe, right? And so we use things like social media posts, advertisements, customer testimonials, our Google page, um, you know, our website, advertising advertising, radio spots, whatever, that's all to drive awareness. Hey, we're here. Hey, look at us, right? It's the whack inflatable arm guy outside the car dealership. That's what that is. So when you're talking about like trade shows specifically or things like that, that are in person one-on-one, -on -one, that's what I need to do is I need to create some kind of value to them to stop and give me information. That's what I want to do. And so the best way to do that is we found the best way to do that in our experience is the punch bowl routine. And that's just literally like, or fish forward team, whatever you want to call it. And that's just literally like, you can win this thing, but you got to give me some info, you know? And then later on, now I will start telling you about the benefits, the price structure, upsells, downsells, all those kind of things that I have available to you and move you through my marketing sequence to ultimately get you to buy. But when I first meet you, the last thing I want to do is be like, I have this really cool product and you really want it and it's only going to cost you $300 to please hand me your money. Right? Because unless that person's been desperately seeking you out, they're going to be like, no, <laughs> and walk away. Okay. All right. So do I have any volunteers? Anyone brave enough to give me their one of their goals? Anybody? Anybody? I think just want to be Okay, cool. All right. So she got a pretty goal of funding in place, process of purchasing land. So that's not necessarily consumer oriented. That's on business setup side, not our marketing side, which is fine though, because you're still in really early phases, it sounds like. But you can still work backwards from that, right? So I want to have um, funding in place. Now I know what I need to do to reach out to potential investors, them, right, and banks and so forth. So I can build a plan on them. So it's a little bit different than marketing, like on the consumer side, 
I'm not looking to generate revenue, but I'm looking to get to an objective and a goal and I can start working backwards on what do I need to do to have funding in place, right? A little bit less daunting if you think about it that way than thinking about, I need funding, how the heck am I gonna get $10 million or whatever it is you're looking for, right? Okay, anyone else got one? Go ahead. Maybe did. Um, if I are you happy about that? I mean, if I can hear my wife. All right. So in 90 days, you want to get the business notice. Okay, so 90 days, you want to start moving first. Do you have a figure on how much you want to build in 90 days? That's where I'm kind of not too sure. So I mean, that's where I would go next. Is I would refine that, define that goal, bring it into like I want to sell, and you can sell it by like units, you can sell it by volume, like all around. Right? Let's say I want to sell thousand, or I want to sell you know um, five thousand dollars in that case. It doesn't have to be like a huge goal or a huge number, but like you want something tangible that we can actually work towards right that, that what we call that kpi the key performance indicator we want to have something to measure so if we make really big statements i can't measure a big statement because it gives me too many outs right so if i keep my statements my goals really vague then i can say ah, i hit it or ah, the reason i didn't hit it is just because you know like time's not quite right or whatever the case is and i can kind of make excuses for myself and this is like literally about being really hard on yourselves, people. You want to succeed in marketing? You got to be mean to yourself. I hate myself on a daily basis. Um, I, lo I love me more, so it's okay. But you got to be really mean to yourself. You got to set something. You got to set that goal. It's got to be like defined so that you don't have an excuse. If you don't hit it, we failed and we know why we failed so that we don't do it again. Okay. Do you have one? Um, yeah, so 30 days, um, our podcast cloud had started with the first one posted. 90 days posted to increase successful training events. Okay, I'm liking this. Now, my challenge to you is to find successful, to find well attended. Take that next step, all right? So I can say, like, in a year, I want to have three events that averaged 250 people per event. Okay, and that's fine. If you want to take me, I'm just throwing out a little bit. I'm just throwing a number out the random. But I'm saying, you see how I can now go back in a year? And I can say, like, we had 220 people. We did not make it. Right? Or we had 290 people. We crushed it. Right, but if I say well attended, then I can start going, you know, we have 43 people show up, but our first one we had two, so it's 43, 43 is pretty good, right? I mean, is that a success? Like, I think that's a success. This will start to make sense as we move on through this a little bit more as to why we're doing this, but that's what we need to do when we define, when we set our goals, okay? All right, so now that we understand where we're going or where we wanna go, right, what the end game is, um, now we need to kind of go into that whole like self-help guru meditation mode. And uh, we need to start asking ourselves that uh, oldest question in the universe of who am I, right? What do I bring to the table? Um, more specifically, you know, who's my company? What's my company bring to the table? That's what we really want to know. And so to do that, sorry, whoa, that was not what I was trying to do. To do that, all right, we're going to do it. We're going to create mission statements. Now, every time I do this, I get a couple of eye rolls. I don't know if I got any here. You're all hiding it pretty well. But every time I say, we're going to create a mission statement, I get a few eye rolls. Okay. But hang in there because a mission statement isn't just some fluff piece that we're going to put out in the press or on our website or something like that. Not if it's done right. So if it's done right, then our mission statement is pretty much going to be the guiding force for all of our business decisions. Like every decision you make in your business, whether it's marketing oriented or whether it is expansion, uh, scaling, adding a new product line, pivoting entirely to a different product, 
is all going to be guided by this mission statement. It is going to become your roadmap for making decisions and kind of the backbone of your success. So how we do that by basically asking ourselves, why does our company exist? What are we doing here, right? I'm going to give you two examples real fast of two of my favorite mission statements. First one, this is like my favorite one of all. Patagonia, build the best product, cause no unnecessary harm. Use business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. Nowhere in there did Patagonia say, our mission statement is to make really good coats. Right? Coats aren't mentioned at all. But I know exactly what Patagonia does. I know exactly what they stand for just by reading that. And every decision they make, they look at this and they go, is this the best product? You know, is it harmful? Will it help the environment? And then they decide to make, make that product or not make that product based upon that, right? They decide to run their marketing campaign based upon that or not. So if an agency like mine comes to them and says, ah, oh, here's what we're gonna do. Like, I wanna go totally Red Bull style and we're gonna have these guys and they're gonna jump out of a helicopter and they're gonna have fireworks strapped to their feet. And, you know, they're gonna spin around on snowboards as they fall into the mountain, explosions, eagles flying. Patagonia is going to look at me and go like, you're stupid, because that's not who we are, right? We know who we are. Look at our mission statement. Okay, here's another one. This one isn't as serious or philosophical, but it's still super impactful. Dunkin' Donuts, or Dunkin' now, to be the world's leading baked good and coffee chain, serving delicious, high-quality products that bring joy and fuel our customers' day. Simple, effective, to the point, but it tells you exactly what Dunkin's about, right? And it doesn't have to say the word donut in there anywhere. So the next handout and the next activity is we are going to create mission statements. And for the sake of time, I'm going to send you home to do this, um, download the handouts. But basically what you're going to get is you're going to get a paper and it's going to have this in there, right? So this is kind of your template. So at home the aim, our mission is to blank by key actions methods providing unique value proposition is just basically what we do better or different than anybody else, right? What makes us us? Um, and then two, target audience. So who are we doing that thing for, right? Um, and then you can have that bottom line. If you want, we are committed to what are our core values? What do we believe in and stand for? And what do we want our objective to be, not just in terms of sales or for our company, but our impact on the market, okay? So you can literally use that and just fill in the blanks like a good old Mad Libs, and you will have a working mission statement, you know, or you can kind of use it as a basis and then refine, you know, subtract, whatever, based off of that. But that should help you get to a point of knowing this is what my company is, why I started, what we're going to focus on, who we're going to serve, and why we're serving them, right? And that's what I want you to come up with or define there, okay? So we're going to skip over writing mission statements right now. We're going to move straight into SWOT analysis. And these aren't scary guys with machine guns that come to your house in the middle of the night because they think you're a drug dealer. SWOT stands for strength, weakness, opportunity, threat. Okay. So basically, so far in our journey, we've defined our goals. We've decided where we want to go, uh, who we are, what values we're going to make those decisions on. But now kind of our goal is to get ourselves into a place uh, where we know how we stack up against our competition, right? Um, but like I said, SWAT is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. This is really kind of gonna give us uh, a backbone for understanding what we want to say to people. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to identify our strengths, right? So we're going to look at what does our business do well or better than anybody else, right? Or what advantage do we possess? Now, I realize a lot of you are in startup phase. So you're like, well, I don't know what my business does well yet because I just thought of it. Well, that right there, whatever reason you thought of to start this business is probably one of your strengths, right? I'm really good at that. So that's why I started this company. Right, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, 
I was really good at marketing and so was my wife. And so we started a marketing agency because we thought, hey, our combined expertise will allow small business owners to get a leg up and a chance to, to market their companies and generate revenue and compete with the big boys who you know can afford to hire bigger agencies. Right. So that was our strength is we had experience in the industry. We had experience on the agency side. We had experience on the product side and we knew what it took to succeed. And we wanted to share that with others. Okay. Next is going to be weaknesses. So you're going to evaluate where, where you're, where you're weak. Like where is your business lacking? Where can it improve? So that could be anything from, um, sorry, I'm trying to scale through here. Um, so that could be anything from, let's see here, limited resources, outdated technology, poor brand awareness, high employee turnover, no capital, right? Those are all weaknesses I have. Um, I was talking with someone today, they're a small business, they're launching a line of industrial detergent cleaning of products for like aerospace industry and manufacturing facilities and so forth. One of their weaknesses that we identified that they're worried about is they do not have the manufacturing capability of some of their competitors, meaning if they scale too fast and get too big of orders in, too many orders at one time, they can't deliver, right? And that's a bad experience. So that's a weakness that they have to overcome. All right, next we're gonna look at opportunities. Oh, here's some questions for weaknesses because I know weakness is hard to address in ourselves. So it's kind of like, what obstacles do we face? Where can I improve? What are my competitors doing better than me? If I can like be honest with those questions, I kind of get a good idea of where I stand on those. Okay, so opportunities. <clears throat> Basically, we're looking at potential avenues for growth or new developments in the market. So that can be anything from changes in trends in consumer behavior, Stanley finding out that some influencer with 50 million followers loves their Tumblr that nobody buys, right? Um, well, she's got a captive audience who all will do anything she says. They want to be just like her. She said, I love this Tumblr. Stanley said, sell them for us, please. Worked out pretty well for them, right? Um, so that would be kind of a, uh, an emerging trend in consumer behavior. Uh, new market segments, untapped market niches. That one I really love because if you can find an untapped niche in your market, you have struck gold, okay? So when I say untapped niche in your market, I mean, we call it red water, blue water sometimes to illustrate the point. But red water is where all the sharks are, right? Water red because it's bloody because all the sharks there, they're feeding, it's feeding friends. So they're eating up all the fish. So everybody naturally gravitates to red water because they're like, there's, there's fish there. We know there's fish there, right? Because everybody's having this heyday, all my competitors. But the problem is those competitors are sharks. They're huge and you're not a shark yet. So you're just gonna get bullied and pushed around. You're just a barracuda or whatever. But, you know, um, but people tend to run there because they go, that's how everyone's doing it. Like, I hate that. That's the worst thing you can do as a business is just follow. Like, everybody's done it this way and they haven't been that successful, but that's how everybody's done it. So, like, let's do it that way. Like, why? Why burn your money? But people all the time, all the time tell me that's how things get done in our industry. Okay. So, that's a red water example. Blue water just means there's sharks there. It doesn't mean there's not fish there. It just means maybe there's not as many fish there. Maybe the fish are a little deeper. Maybe you gotta try a different lure, right? But if you can find, if you can find a honey hole in blue water, right? Then now you're just pulling out fish left and right. Um, and you're not competing with the sharks. So you're not slashing your profit margins, right? Um, or killing yourself working 22 hour days to try to get bids out before they pick somebody else. You're just sitting there like taking business. So look for those untapped niches. Look for those places inside your, of your industry that others are avoiding because either they need to be tweaked a little bit, right? Uh, approached a little bit differently because that customer base might have a slightly different problem than the rest of the market. Um, 
you know, yeah. things like that, that those are going to create uh, really fast, really easy and valuable opportunities for you if you can find them. Um, all right. And then basically now, once you find that, you're just going to ask yourself, like, again, what are our strengths and how can we leverage those strengths to capitalize on this opportunity? Whatever that is, right? That's somebody talking about your product or that's somebody complaining about your competitor's product. How can I leverage that, right, to get my product in front of more eyeballs? Um, you know, how can I find those untapped market niches? How can I now adjust my messaging or my delivery of my solution to fit their problem and their needs? We're going we're gonna to start analyzing that stuff. And then the last thing we're going to do is look for threats, okay? So threats are anything that would be an external factor, not internal. Internal factors are weaknesses, right? So my client scalability in manufacturing, that's a weakness. Um, a threat would basically be, uh, I have a generic product. There's no patent on it, right? So I can make it for $2.37 and I'm selling it for $6.50. And as long as I'm the only one manufacturing that product, I'm fine. But if Procter & Gamble decides they want to get in on this line of business, they can probably manufacture it for $0.47, cents, which means they're going to undercut me in the dollar figure, the sales figure, and drive me out, right? That, that's external. It's outside my control. It's not something I'm doing, but that is entirely a threat to my business, right? So things like products that aren't patentable, that are basically what we call commodity items. Um, COVID, COVID was a huge threat, right? So if you owned a bar or a restaurant or you know um, any number of places that, that depended on foot traffic during COVID, you likely went out of business um, or you had to take some serious subsidies just to stay afloat and survive it, right? But you can't control COVID and you can't control any regulations that get put in place when something like that happens, right? That's a threat. Um, so those are kind of, those are, those are threats, those are obstacles. You wanna be aware of them and you wanna have a plan to deal with them. How are we gonna survive if this happens, right? So if we can't sell in store anymore, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna go on Amazon? Is that our strategy is to have an Amazon store set up, right? That could be a, a solution to that. But I need to identify that threat and I need to identify a solution to that threat, okay? Um, yeah, so you're also gonna get a template inside of that download. It's called, it's a SWOT analysis. It's basically four grids, right? And all you're gonna do is write inside of each one, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, as many as you can list out, right? Um, and then start thinking about how you can leverage or respond to each of those. Okay, so now on our journey, we've defined our goals. We know where we wanna go. We know who we are, what values we're gonna make our decisions on. Um, so we're, we're doing our SWOT analysis, right? And the next thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna focus on what's called SMART objectives. So these are basically, we're gonna set goals now again, but instead of the first time we set goals, they were very broad stroke, right? Um, you know, I know I asked you to put a number and be specific, but you have broad stroke goal. I want well attended events, right? Now we're gonna make, turn that into what we call smart. So what exactly do I want to accomplish? So that's specific. So that's what SMART stands for. Specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time bound. So specific, what exactly do I want? How do I define well attended? Is it 100 people? Is it 200 people? Is it 1,000 people? Is it 10 people? It doesn't matter, you know what I mean? Like it's gonna be different for your business, but you need to define that, okay? Um, be specific. Next, measurable. So how are you going to determine both my progress toward my goal and my success, right? Um, what is your measurement? What are those KPIs that we talked about? Achievable. Is my goal realistic? Some people, like guys named Jason, tend to sometimes set up like really big goals that they don't fully think out, 
And so if, uh, if a Jason, if a me uses this smart objectives approach, they go, is it achievable? And normally 99% of the time, it's my timeline that's not achievable. And I'm like, yeah, no, you cannot create an entire marketing university inside of 30 days. You're stupid. Um, but without doing that, I'm like, yeah, we're going to do this and we're going to launch it in 30 days. And we haven't started on it yet. And everybody goes, yeah, and starts pushing out the message. Right. And then I come back and go like, guys, I haven't worked on that yet because I've just been so busy with client side stuff. And my team boos and hisses and throws popcorn at me in our meetings. Um, so achievable. Is it a realistic goal? Do I have the resources? Do I have the time available to meet that? Right. Relevant. Going back to our mission statement, does that go align with our business objective? Is it going to generate remedy revenue? Is it going to grow or improve my business in any way? Or is it something that's totally outside? Like, um, we are all here because you're entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs have a common thread at times of being a little ADD, right? And so we put so many irons in the fire that we stop focusing on that one idea that we initially got excited about and launched. We're like, oh, we can do this, and then we can do that, and then we can do this. Um, don't do that. Like, stay relevant to what your purpose is. You created your company for a reason. You believe that you can bring something of value to market. Focus on that. If it's not part of that, let it go. You can always come back to it later. And then time bound. That's the last one. So that's just basically time bound is uh, how much time am I giving myself to do this? What's the deadline on it? You're right. So I have 90 days to accomplish this. I have six months to accomplish this. Let's like hold our feet to the fire. Okay. This will be another sheet you'll get on there creating smart objectives. So you're just literally going to take one of your goals, whatever one of those high level goals you had, I want you to break it down into that specific, measurable, attainable. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, relevant and time bound. We were going to do it today, but we're not. Um, all right, next we're going to focus on our target audience. Okay, so basically, defining your target audience, your audience profile is going to be really essential to effectively reach, engage, and have that conversation, that dialogue we talk about with your customers. And Rocco, I know we're running low on time, so if you got a hard stop, just kick me off. Um, otherwise, if you guys don't mind, I'm just going to go until someone tells me to shut up. Cool? All right. Uh, <laughs> or my wife calls and yells at me because I'm not helping put children to bed. One or the other. Um, all right. So basically, how are we going to have that conversation with our customers, right? Um, and the only way we can do that is to really determine what is important to them. Who are they and how do we fit into their lives, right? What problem are we solving? Um one of the most problematic answers I get when I ask people to define their target audience is everyone, everyone could use this. Everyone could benefit up from this. Kind of goes back to like, if you have kids, the whole Lorax thing and the Sneed and everybody needs a Sneed and whatever else, you know, but it's like, I all the time hear like, well, just, just about everybody. You don't want everybody to be your audience because then you're literally spending money on trying to attract people who have no interest, desire, or problem that they need solved by your product. And you're throwing money down the drain trying to convince them that they are your audience. So what I want you to focus on instead is what we call a minimum viable audience. Minimum viable audience is the smallest group of people that you can build your business around. I can have a successful business. My business can sustain. I can make a paycheck if I have these customers in my corner, right? So even if you think everyone is a possible audience for you, that's great. Start with a minimum viable audience. Who are your core customers, right? Um, for some people, that may be less than 200 people. Uh, so an example I like to use is if I'm a manufacturer of a release trigger mechanism for rocket boosters, then my audience is probably only a handful of governments and private companies out there, like Jeff Bezos and stuff. Um, I don't need to convince my plumber that I have the best rocket detachment mechanism out there on the market. He doesn't care. He will never buy it. So I don't want to waste my time or money on him, right? 
reality is if you're trying to be everything to everybody, then you're really going to water down your brand and kind of end up being nothing. Um, so focus on that minimal viable audience, focus on, on those people who are going to get you to the next level. Um, they're the ones who you want to make happy. Okay. Um, the other thing that reason we say to focus on minimal viable audience goes back to entrepreneurs and the whole where ADHD is we chase every dollar that possibly comes our way. And somebody goes, have you thought about doing this because it could make money? We're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There. Like, if you focus on your minimum viable audience and what their needs are and their problems are, when somebody says, I think this person may be a, right, you know, may be a fit for your product, you can say, no, no, that's not who we're looking for right now. Like, that's a great idea. And down the road, definitely we can expand our product deal with them. But right now we focus on these people and we're not constantly kind of going what we call squirrel in our business um, all the time. Again, another kid movie reference, but where we're like literally doing one thing, we'll squirrel. And over there, um, we stay focused, we stay on task and we make sure that our marketing messaging, our campaigns are on point by focusing on this group. It also keeps you from becoming generic and becoming a commodity. Now, when I say commodity, Commodity is anything that anybody can make. And really what a commodity boils down to is just price, right? If I make nails, nails are a commodity. There's going to be no difference between Jason's nail and Ace Hardware's nail and someone else's, you know, Home Depot's nail. They're all nails. So really, why do people buy my nail over Ace's nail? Probably because of price. You know, I might have some doing materials or something, but... 99.999% of the time it's going to be price and availability. That's what commodities decision making is focused on. So if you if your business is a commodity item, I'm not trash talking you. I'm not telling you it won't work. What I'm telling you is a lot of the things I'm saying won't be relevant to you, right? But if you're not a commodity, if you have a unique selling position, a new unique value proposition that you can present to the market then the last thing you want to do is try to become everything to everyone or chase every possible customer out there because you will become generic and you will become a commodity at that point. Um, all right. Question? Yeah. When you draw up your target market, uh-huh. okay. and that's not all to fall under like, uh, Absolutely. Yeah, you're great at giving me an awesome segue here. Okay. So we're going to talk about who our minimal viable audience are and how they are, how you define who they are. And that's going to focus on a couple of different segments. One is called demographics. And that's what you're talking about. So demographics is any tangible classification that I can assign to a customer group. So it could be an age range, it could be gender, it could be income level, it could be zip code or area that they live in, it could be the kind of car they drive. Those are all demographics, right? Um, going back to the whole 40 years ago, how we advertise versus now thing, 40 years ago, all we had to work on was demographics. So I knew I wanted you to buy a Cadillac. I knew I wanted to focus on specific areas that had people who made this much money, and, you know, I wanted those people to be between the ages of 35 and 65 and a homeowner. So then I would look at magazines and newspaper, or I mean, in the newspaper, um, magazines, newspapers, and television programs that fit that audience, right? So they said, oh, yeah, most of our viewers or readers are this age, live in this area, and make this much money. And that's why they subscribe to our magazine. Right? So, okay, that's a fit for me, or it's not. Does that make sense? So those are demographics. We use demographics to define our audience profile. We also use psychographics. Psychographics are basically in-person behaviors. They are more important now than ever because with social media and with our ability to get personal with our customer and actually have a conversation with them and not just ask some information to them, um, psychographics become super important because now we can focus on that problem we're solving. Right. I get to know about you. What's important to you? What do you need? Right. And then I can say, 
I have that solution to you. So psychographics are things like interests. So, you know, um, uh, the, the school I went to or the team I follow, that's a psychographic, right? So now when, uh, the, the, what are just sports, which is a clothing sports, clothing manufacturer, whatever, decides they want to advertise to me, they don't send me like a picture of a Los Angeles Lakers t-shirt and say, hey, you may want to buy this. They go like, oh, hey, he went to Arizona State. He's probably a Sun Devil fan. And they send me a picture of a Sun Devil t-shirt. And they say, you totally want to buy this. So you're not a fan and you didn't, you're a bad alumni and we hate you. And I go, yeah, that makes sense to me. Like, I'm a good alumni. And click the button, right? So those are, those are psychographics. The psychographics are interest, personality traits, things like that. Um, so there are other brands that they follow, right? So you can literally on Facebook, when you set up advertising, things like that, you can literally ask Facebook to identify people who follow similar brands. Could be your competitor or could be just someone in a similar industry. So you guys do events or something. I'm not going to put you totally on the spot, but let's just say you do events in like wellness and mental health, right? So I want to know people who follow yoga. I want to know people who follow, uh, oh man, what's her name? You know, it was podcast, you know, who does that? I, I had a woman's name in my mind. Like, but anyway, I want to know these types of people because that's the type of people who probably be interested in my product, right? Um, you know, if I, if I have the world's hottest salsa, I want to know people who like, like spicy food, like Mexican food, you know, our adventurous eaters. I don't want to know, like, the guy who thinks ketchup is a sin and spicy. Like that guy ain't gonna buy my salsa, right? Um, so if I just focus on just demographics, I may say most of our salsa eaters are between the ages of 25 and 45 and are male. He can follow that demographic, but guy's taste buds are weak. You know what I mean? Like he's not gonna buy my salsa. So I wanna know instead, like, hey, who likes my salsa? Who watches hot ones on Netflix or YouTube? Like that's the kind of person I want to appeal to. Right. So we can start making sort of educated guesses or assumptions of if you like this, then this might be for you. And when we start doing that, we get a we can dial in that minimum viable audience. And we can get a much clearer picture of who our customers are um, and not try to be everything to everybody. So that's a really good question. But so we use a combination of both of those. Right. So. This exercise that you'll get as well. Basically, I want you guys to create three to four, what we call avatars, audience avatars. Um, so basically, this is like a customer, but I want it to be a very specific customer. So I want you guys to give them a name, right? Um, so it could be like Chops a Lot Sally. I don't know, rhyming is, makes it work really well. So bonus points if you rhyme. But, all right, I want to know Chops a Lot Sally. I want to know how old Chops a Lot Sally is. I want to know, um, you know, her gender, her education level, her occupation, job title, does she have a family? Uh, you know, is she married or single? Where does she live? Um, you know, what kind of money she makes? That's kind of a combination. Those are mostly, those are mostly going to be demographics, right? Um, but then below those spots before there, it's like, what's Sally interested in? What are Sally's goals and values? What's Sally's problems and challenges? You know, maybe Sally, I don't know, maybe I'm a, I'm a gym. And, uh, and you know, so Sally's interested in yoga and she's interested in Pilates um, and she wants to work out four times a week. But her problem is, is she doesn't have childcare available during the classes, right? She has no one to watch her kids. So maybe there's an opportunity there for me to bring daycare into my gym or something. You know what I mean? If it makes sense. But you're gonna kind of go through those, through those things and basically create three to four avatars, three to four of your minimal viable audience target customers. These are the people I wanna to sell to. Okay? They're gonna be the basis for what I do. So it's not everyone anymore. I'm selling specifically, I'm generating marketing material and marketing campaigns specifically targeted at selling specifically targeted at Fred, you know, at whoever, um, you know, uh, Corvette Arnold, whatever the case is. Like, that's that's what I want to know. Like, get real specific with this, have fun with it, 
but like give them give them traits, give them a name, all that kind of stuff. Uh, make up story of their life, okay? And then once you're done with that, go back and look for commonalities between them. If you can find a commonality that runs between all four that you've made, you've probably identified either one of their desires or one of their problems. And you need to figure out how you can tap into that with your product, right? All these people are experiencing the same problem or same need or want, and I have this solution. Boom, I got this out real easy right there, right? Because now my stuff sells itself. I don't have to convince you if you're looking for a solution to a problem. Um, all right, so we're cooking now. The marketing mix. I'm just going to go over this real broad stroke. I've given you, I mean, honestly, this is a master class in and of itself, and it's really hard to get through it all. But you guys kind of need to understand it before you start setting up campaigns themselves. But basically, the marketing mix is just the, what we call the four piece of marketing. So, the product place promotion and price. Everybody always wants to focus here on promotion, but, and that's the bulk of what I do, right? That's creative, that's ads, that's all that stuff on the leads to sales. Specifically, and that's where everybody wants to put all their time in. But the problem is, is everybody focuses so high on promotion they forget all the rest. So the reality is, is you've got a product, right? And did you do a value? It's a product or a service. Sorry, it should be product or service, but service those are a piece that you can buy out. Sorry. But you've got a product, you need to evaluate it. What are the features? How does it interact? How does it engage with that audience? Is there something that doesn't work? that prohibits its usage that could be improved upon? Is everything doing great? Evaluate your product, because I will tell you, you can promote and promote and promote and promote. You can probably generate a lot of sales in your first campaign, your first out, you know, if it's done correctly and you pump a lot of money into it. The second somebody goes, that didn't work. All that money's down the drain and I give you six months in business. So you've got to make sure my product works. It fills a need. It solves a problem in the market, right? Place, that's the location of your distribution. So where are we going to sell this? How are we going to sell this? Okay. So that could be by zip code. So for example, if I have, if I teach, if I have a swim school, I teach swim lessons, right? I have a physical building. So therefore I know that I want people inside of these zip codes is who I want to target. Because I can't sell swim lessons online. Oh, maybe I can. But, um, you know, I haven't figured it out yet. I need a pool to actually get into. So I know that any marketing I do needs to be targeted to a specific zip code, a specific environment, right? Um, if I'm distributing my products regionally, globally, internationally, there's different uh, requirements different pain points, right? Different opportunities with each of those. So I kind of just need to evaluate all of that and determine where's the best place for me to sell. Is it the best place for me to sell on an Amazon store, right? And sell on Amazon? Or is it better for me to set up my own e-commerce store with my website? Or is it better for me to sell straight through Facebook or Instagram? You can set up stores on those now too, you know, or Pinterest. Um, that's place, right? So where am I going to be doing my selling? Where is my audience hanging out? Where's my blue water, right? And then price. Price is another big one. Um, so this goes back to that competitive market analysis, that SWOT analysis that we ran. Um, I suggest running SWOT analysis not on just your company, but try to run a SWOT analysis on your top three competitors, especially focusing on where their weaknesses are, right? I know what they can't do well. Can I do it really good? If I can, there's an opportunity for me there. Um, the focus on like don't check your price, make sure your price fits with the market, that you're not too high, or your profit margins aren't too low. I see that sometimes too, where people have to move so many units to make a profit because their margins are so low that they just basically pigeonhole themselves into a corner and they can never get ahead in their business, or they don't have money to do things like expand by that new piece of equipment spend money on an advertising campaign or a marketing campaign and they just constantly tread water and the reality is it's like you know you need to bump your prices three percent ah but then i might lose some customers 
Yeah, but you know, like, what are you going to do? If one of your customers walks now, where's your business going to be? So there's an old rule called the 80 20 rule. Some of you probably heard of it, but it just means 80% of your business is probably going to be generated by 20% of your customer base. So you're going to have really big fish, really big customers, and a bunch of small customers, right? We don't want that. We would rather be a 50 50 because if I have one of my big fish walk away, it's generating 80% of my business. How do I stay alive, right? So that's all that pricing strategy. It needs to be looked at. People don't think it's part of marketing, but those three things are all part of marketing. And then you can focus on the promotion. And that's all those marketing accounts. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And... Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely there's something called perceived value yeah and that that is absolutely so you want to align with that so if i'm trying to position myself as a luxury good right um meaning i'm higher quality i'm handmade i'm um uh whatever boutique right um and I'm a luxury good, I don't want to have Walmart prices. Like, if I do, people are going to say, how are you luxury? You know what I mean? How are you any better than, than theirs if you can sell it for the same price as they are? Something's wrong, right? It sets off red flags. So that's absolutely right. So when we talk about pricing, you're not just asking yourself questions like, how much will somebody pay for your widget? Um, it's going to be things like, how much is my competitor? Or if I don't have a direct competitor, my, my competition, meaning the alternative out there, how much are they selling their solution for? Can I justify a difference in price between them? Like, is my product that much better? Do I have some kind of differentiating factor, right? I don't have to align dollars and cents um, with, with everybody else, but I do need to have a reason for why, if I want you to spend a little bit more, why you're getting more value out of it. Or if I'm less, I need to have an explanation for that too. Why, how can I do it less than they can, right? Um, I have to answer both those questions. So, you know, those those are a couple of the things you need to ask as well there. Um, you'll get a marketing mix uh, exercise too. I'm going to skip over that. Uh, excuse me. All right. And then the last thing we're going to do before we actually build a real campaign is, because we're working backwards, right, is now we're going to build a budget. So I don't want you to come in and tell me like, oh, we want to do social media advertisement. We want to put an uh, ad in the newspaper and I want to like uh, rent a plane and fly it over the state for the next 45 days without telling me what your budget is first, please. Um, too often it happens when people just think that they're going to magically do a bunch of things and they don't understand what the costs involved are or they have the costs misaligned. So we're going to create a budget first, right? Um, so this is sort of like, like I said, this is like a typical budget interaction that I have almost daily in my business. Hey, hello, I need marketing to promote my product. Okay, great. What's your budget? I have $3,000. I think I can spend that on marketing. I can afford to lose that. Oh okay, yeah, we can make that work. And that's the end of it, right? That's the old agency model right there. Um, and that's how most most marketing agencies and most business owners are actually going about establishing marketing budgets is people look at their marketing budget like they look at going to Vegas. They literally go, this is the money I can afford to take out of my bank account and go play with. And if it makes me money, cool, you know, like I'm happy. And if I lose it, it won't hurt that and that's how they go to market. I don't get it. I love Vegas. Don't get me wrong. I am love Vegas maybe too much sometimes. But uh, that's not how we do marketing. So it creates a lose-lose situation. It's a lose for you as a business owner. It's a lose for your, your marketer, you know, or whoever you're working with. Um, because it's just sets up, it's a recipe for failure. 
So we're going to look for that new angle, right? And so instead of saying like, I have this much money to spend, we're going to reverse engineer our budget and we're going to say, what amount will it take for me to reach my defined objective? Okay, we're going to get into math here for a minute and then I'm going to let you guys go. But we're going to get your head spinner. So basically, we're going to ask that question every time we decide to create a marketing campaign. What amount will it take for me to reach my defined objective? And then we're going to do a whole bunch of math. So here's what we're going to start with. We're going to take the goal that we established before, one of our SMART goals, right? And I told you, like, give me an actual number. So um, let's find a dollar amount that we can associate with the goal. So let's say I have my swim school. I want to make $10,000. That's my dollar amount, okay? That's my goal, 10000 now I need to determine what my average sale is. Now, if you just started, you may not know this, um, you know, uh, but you're just gonna have to do your best kind of on, you know, based upon what your product priced at and so forth. But for my example, we're gonna say it's $100, okay? So my goal is to make $10,000. My average sale is gonna be $100. Now I'm gonna take those two numbers and that's gonna tell me the number of customers or number of sales that I'm gonna to need to reach my goal. So we're gonna take 10,000, we're gonna divide that by 100, okay? Um, and that's gonna give me 100. So Jason needs 100 customers to attend his swimming lesson school to get $10,000 in revenue, all right? We're cooking now. Now I need to decide what my cost per acquisition is. Cost per acquisition is a marketing term. It just basically means how much can I expect to spend to get generate one set? Like how much marketing dollars am I going to put into getting this one customer, right? So to do this, we are going to take, if you're an established business, what you're going to do is you're going to take your total marketing cost spent over a specific time period. So let's say the last six months, divide that by the number of sales you had in the same time period and boom, you got it. If you're a brand new business or you just haven't tracked that stuff at all, you're gonna have to do a little guesswork. Um, and so what I think the easiest way to go about it is just take your gross profit margin and allocate a percentage that you feel comfortable putting into marketing from, okay? So it's a little bit guesswork and we're gonna have to refine it on our next campaign, but it's a good way to start our first campaign. So we're all in business to make money. So obviously I can't put 100% of my gross profit margin into marketing. Um, that's a loss leader. And I can only do that if I'm trying to launch an IPO or something like Facebook. Uh, then I can go in debt so that I can have your money. But um, that's not me. I'm a private business. I own a swim school. Nobody wants to buy stocks. So therefore I've got to figure out what the percentage is gonna be, right? Uh, for the sake of this exercise, I'm going to say I can spend 20%. That's what I feel comfortable is putting 20% of, of what I make back into marketing. Okay. So my profit margin, I'm going to say my profit margin is 20% as well. So I have my hundred dollars. It's 20 bucks. So I made $20 gross profit off of every sign up I get for my swim lessons which means if I'm willing to spend 20% of that on marketing, I'm willing to spend $4. That's my maximum spend to acquire a new customer, right? So that means now my assumed cost per acquisition is $4, okay? That's how much money I'm going to spend to generate a sale. I won't go over that. If I go under that, that's awesome, that's a win. But the goal is to not go over that, okay? Are you guys with me so far? Okay, cool, because I'm horrible at math, which is why I do advertising. And nobody told me I was gonna have to do this crap. Um, okay, now it's just gonna be simple math. So basically what I'm gonna do, <laughs> simple math, is I'm gonna take the number of customers that I need to reach that goal, right? So number three, um, I'm gonna take that number and I'm gonna times that by my cost per acquisition. So I know to make $10,000, I need 100 customers. I'm willing to spend up to $4 for each customer, which means I need a marketing budget of $400 to meet my $10,000 in revenue, okay? How many people here right now would spend $400 if it made them 10 grand? I like that there's some hands that aren't go up. You guys are stingy and 
don't call me. Um, but uh, no, it's, it's awesome. All right. So that's basically, I've just now, I've reverse engineered a marketing budget, right? Instead of saying, I'm going to pump $400 into this and see what it generates. I've got a clear goal. I want $10,000. I know exactly how much I'm willing to spend, what my cap is per customer. Because if you don't define that as well, what happens is your ad spend runs away and your marketing agency is like, guess what? We've got 10 new customers. You're like, that's awesome. How much of my money have you spent so far? $297. You're going to need to put a little bit more money into that account, buddy. Um, you know, but now I know exactly like I'm going to spend this. This is my CPA. Um, so now I've got all that stuff laid out, right? I've got my budget amount. So the last thing all I need to do is determine basically what channels are going to give me the best return on my investment and then establish my KPIs. How am I going to measure this to make sure that we're staying on track and reaching our objective? So for the sake of my um, swim school example, let's say I want to appeal to a specific zip code. And my target audience is going to be moms with young kids between the ages of two and seven. So for me, doing something offline like postcards could be an effective delivery channel. Okay, I know an average postcard, I think postage right now for postcards is like 42 cents. But an average postcard runs about 70 to 75 cents. Okay, that's like design, print, and, and postage. Um, so I want to put half my budget into postcards at 70 cents. That means I can send out 285 postcards. Okay. Additionally, I want to run ads on Facebook because where is every single consumer audience spend 90% of their time nowadays? Facebook, right? Um, Instagram, Facebook, social media. So I want to run some ads on social media. So I'm going to decide, and there's a formula for this. I'm not going to get into right now, but I'm going to decide how much I'm willing to pay per click. So when you run ads on social media, you can either pay what's called CPM, which is cost per thousand, which just means number of impressions. So if every time my ad gets shown a thousand times in feeds, they pull X number of dollars or cents out of my account, right? Um, regards to whether anybody bought anything or did anything with that or whatever, they can stroll right past it and money's still coming out. The other model is cost per click. It's a little more expensive. It's generally more effective. However, um, and cost per click basically means anytime someone clicks on my ad, responds to that ad. So they stop and there's a button there that says like, you know, special on swim lessons, 40% off, sign up now. And they click on that and it takes them to a landing page or a form or something like that then that's when the money gets withdrawn for my account. So I'm going to choose for this sake, I'm going to choose a cost per click model, a CBC model. And let's say I'm just going to set it at 75 cents. That's just a random number I'm making up for the sake of this example. Uh, social media will actually give you, because they're so kind and helpful, and not at all because they just want to take your money, but they will actually give you recommended CPC and CPM budgets where they like after you put in all of your audience demographics and site graphics and what you're trying to accomplish kind of thing, they'll say, we recommend a dollar 85 per click. And you can say, sure, run it. You guys know best, or you can literally go in and set your own parameters, right? Problem is, is if you set them too low, your ad might not get seen. If you set them too high, you're eating through your budget where you could have got it a lot cheaper. So sometimes it's best to let Facebook do their thing. Um, but for this argument, this sake, I'm going to say I'm willing to pay 75, per, 75 cents per click to my registration page. So my other $200 divided by 75 cents gives me 267 clicks. Okay. So in this example, I've identified I've got a budget of $400 to make me 10000 And from that, based on those numbers I just gave you, I think I can get 550 new leads. So out of 550 leads, I need 100 people to convert. That's a conversion rate of one out of every five, so 20%. Could be high, could be low. You know what I mean? It's really going to depend on your industry and stuff. Um, for online advertising, I'll just tell you guys, usually single digits are what your conversion rates are in online world. So if you can get up into 10, 11, 12%, you're really smoking. Um, 
you know, but offline can be different, targeted can be different. It really just depends on your product and your niche and how good you do at defining your audience. Um, but anyway, so I need a conversion rate of 20% is what I know. So going through that and doing all that, I now have my budget, right? I have my KPIs. The ultimate goal is $10,000. I want, sorry, 267 clicks. I want 285 postcards. I want 550 leads. I don't want to spend more than $4 per customer. Um, and I want to reach a conversion rate of 20%. Those are all objectives that are tangible that I can measure the effectiveness of this campaign by when it's over and say, did I do a good job? Or did I stop, right? Um, and do it next time. So I hope you see kind of how, like, if we start at the end and we work backwards, it helps all these other things fall into place and we can create like a better marketing campaign that actually we know where our money's going, we know what it's doing for us, and we know how to make adjustments and pivot. Because doing it this way, I can track this all along too. And I can say, like, my ads aren't reaching. At 75 cents on um, my social media ads. So I need to take that ad down and maybe put up a different one with a different call to action, we call it, right? So maybe I need instead of 20%, I need to offer 35% off our last service. Or, you know what I mean? Maybe I just need to reach, shake the way we're saying things. So instead of, you know, being like, hey, learn how to swim like, a, like an Olympic athlete, I can like, don't let your kids drown this summer, you know? Like just change that call to action. There's, ways i can adjust my campaign as it's going live if i start seeing red flags pop up if i just say here's my budget this is what i'm going to do run some ads i don't know until it's over and then i'm kind of guessing anyway whether i felt like it was a success or not like yeah i feel good about it or you know yeah, it didn't work you know this is tangible so you're gonna have a worksheet that walks you through how to do this stuff too um, like I said, if you're a new business, you're probably going to have to make some assumptions in places. Uh, but the idea is, first time you make some assumptions, you run the campaign, you see what the results are. The second time, you've got more tangible information you can draw from, right, to develop it. Uh, last thing, and I know we're getting really late, guys, so if we want to wrap up, we can wrap up. But I just want to talk to you quick about a funnel, because everything we've talked about is kind of how to structure a marketing plan and set it up. Funnels are how you actually get information out there and attract customers. So we use an uh, AID model, right? Which stands for awareness, interest, desire, action, okay? So at the very top of your funnel, we call them funnels because they're shaped like funnels. So the very top of your funnel is called awareness. So imagine all these people are floating out here above here and they're all potential customers, right? They're all our target audience, but they don't know we exist. They don't know anything about us. So the very top of the funnel, awareness phase, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, this is me, I'm here, hey, look at me, right? This is our whack inflatable arm guy at slot. So these are things that we're gonna do like, um, I'm sorry, all right, let's talk about the customer first or the prospect. In the awareness stage, they should be aware of their problem and aware possibly, not always, but possibly that there is a solution or what solutions are out there and available to them. They may not know you have that solution, but they know like there's a problem. So like, oh, I'm suffering from hair loss. And I know there's either like a pill I can take or there's a shampoo I can use or something. I need to look at one of those because, you know, um, I want to look like Matthew McConaughey. So that wasn't a person for you guys. Um, so anyway, that's kind of where they're at during that stage. Um, you during that stage, I think we're going to work on that next. All right. So during the interest stage, the prospect, they are basically now they're showing interest in a group of services or products, interest in the solution. So that's like kind of the like, I know that there is a shampoo out there that's supposed to help me regrow my hair. I want to learn more about it. Right. So during the interest phase, I'm, I'm building interest. That's exactly what they're doing. So I'm gathering information, I'm doing research, I'm consuming your marketing material, right? I'm consuming reviews and things from my peers, 
right? Did, hey, has anyone done this? Does it work? You know what I mean? How, how's it going for you um, to make a decision? Which these two kind of work together. That's why we call them, we call them the middle tunnel. That's why it's bracketed right there. But basically, which should create a desire. So our marketing materials that we're putting out during the interest phase should make them start saying like, yes, you have a solution to my problem. That's awesome. I'm totally interested in it. Doesn't mean I'm really ready to look at my credit card yet, but I want, I, I want this. Yet. Like I want to know more about it. I want it. Um, okay. So that's kind of what we're trying to do. We're trying to, hey, we know you, we know you have a problem and we are here with the solution to the problem. Here's more about our solution. Yes, they want that, and then ACT. And ACT is just basically our conversion. So at the bottom of the funnel. So that's basically, do they buy, do they don't buy, right? Um, here's one thing I'll say about that is, this, you know, a lot of funnels tends to be a huge start point for people. Because we're afraid of it, though. Right? So we get to this point and we put in all this work and a lot of hard work and spend time and money attracting you. I don't want you to say no. So I kind of just keep right here, just feeding you some more stuff and trying to get it in and never have to ask for the sale or sell them. Here's why no is as important, if not more important, than a yes. Because if I get a no, A, they're not damned up there, meaning I'm not spending my money and time trying to close somebody who will never close. B, I can move them into what we call a regenerative fund, which means it's a no for you right now, or it's a no because my price point was too high. Well, here's another offer, right? Um, so I can move them into something that may solve their problem better um, or approach it in a different way, right? And B, I make room for more yeses. So like, don't get hung up with somebody saying no or on the prospect or rejection. It's great, because at least we now know why they didn't buy and what we can do with them next. Like, I just either kick this dude to the curb because, you know, he's kicking tires and he's never going to buy. So get lost, dude. Or I can say like, oh, okay, it was this reason. You're just not ready yet because you're anticipating a relocation in six months. Awesome. I will be contacting you in six months one day, right? Um, but I can make those decisions. So, yes or no, that's the action stage. They're either going to say, yeah, I want that, or no, I want, don't want it, and buy from you or your competitor. All right, here's what we're going to do during all these stages to move them through our funnel, because our goal is to get them down the bottom, right? So, where is the you know, stage? Things that fall into the weird stage are things like website landing pages, ads, social media posts, postcards, mailers. Commercials, you know, radio or television, and sponsorships, and things, or attending trade shows. That's all awareness phase. You don't know I'm here. I want you to know I'm here. Here's some information about me to make the introduction, right? From that, we need to move them down into it. So this content needs to be compelling enough that they want to know more about us, right? I found out about you. I heard about you. And now I kind of want to follow you. I want to see what more of your posts are, right? I want to see what you have to say. Next, we're going to like interest space. So that's going to be like where I said website landing pages up there. A landing page to us is something that has one target message, and that's it. So it's for one specific audience demographic or psychographic, but one specific audience profile, and it has one call to action. I want you to do one thing when you visit this. It could be download my book, right? So I'm a marketing guy, I do marketing, that's my job, that's where I make my money, but I've got this free ebook that I wrote on how you can do your own marketing, Marketing 101. It's the fishbowl, right? It's the way I get you to give me your information, but that's all my landing pages. It doesn't go, hey, you can hire me for $10,000 to overhaul your company's marketing. No, it just says like, get a free ebook, learn all the tricks and trades and secrets of being a professional marketer, Give me your email address and your name and your company name right here. Fill out this form, we'll email it right over to you, right? One call to action. So that's what a landing page is. Your website, website pages, that's your business card on the line, right? That's your information. So that's where they start investigating. They become investigators. Now I want to learn more about you. I want to learn more about your solution. Jason, I want to know about the types of marketing that you guys do and what the costs are of that. And if my business is a fit for you, do you guys specialize in my vertical? 
meaning verticals are just different categories of businesses, right? So like, do you guys work with a lot of trades companies or do you work with a lot of manufacturers or do you work with lawyers, et cetera, et cetera? That's what my website's for, is to start showcasing everything we do and allowing them to gather information to make an informed decision, engage in that conversation, right? My social media is entirely about engaging in conversation. So that's about me listening to what's important to them and responding and appealing back, right? Um, white papers, white papers, just like the ebook example I gave, are really good ones to, um, to both awareness and pretty much generate interest and desire because white papers basically anything that is a documented like a study essentially. So we did this for another business in your industry and saved them ultimately $10,000 by switching them over to our software or our manufacturing process or implementing you know, our widget instead of the one they were using. Save them this much money, increase productivity this much money. So we wrote this little paper, a couple of pages, this report that shows how we did it. That makes me interested and want you guys to work with you guys, right? Because if my competitor just increased productivity by 22% by using your widget instead of the competitors, like I need to know what your widget is and how it's going to help me, right? Uh, coupons, special offers. Coupons, special offers, except that you're consumer facing are really good to use this level because they push down to action. They bridge that gap between desire and action, right? So, like, okay, I have my swim school. I have, it's $100 for you to come to my swim school. But if you book today for our next class starting next month, it's $10 off, right? That's a marketing cost, $10. I'm going to have to factor into my cost per acquisition. But, um, you know, that's an incentive for somebody to be acting right now to make that jump between desire and action. Um, and then a free trial is another way. So if you've got a software or a subscription-based model to something, something like that, a free trial is a good way to get people to check you out, start using you. The idea is once I start using this, I don't want to go backwards, right? So it works. I need it. Now I'm going to have to pay up and pony up the dough for it. So those are all kind of those. And then, like I said, actions by or decline. What we want to know, though, is we want to try to find out why did they make the choice they did, even if they declined or chose a competitor. What about my competitor's widget? Made you go with them, right? Because then I can craft future marketing messaging on that. And then finally, below that, there's kind of a new area to the funnel people add. Um, I'm just going to throw in reaction. But that's basically retention and brand advocacy. So, you know, once I've spent all this time and effort getting a customer, I don't want to let them go. I don't want to just be like, we did our transaction. Good day, sir. Right. Um, I've got other products or opportunities, hopefully, that I can sell or things that they can do. So for you guys, you know, I've got another event coming up. I want to make sure that they know about it. That they've got some kind of offer they feel special and want to join in that event. Right. I don't want them to just be like, come back to me. Hey guys, I heard from somebody that you guys put on another event and I didn't even know or I would have thought like that's the one thing you can hear as a business owner. It's like, oh I lost revenue. Um so we want brand advocates. We want to re we want retention, we want brand advocates. So we want to make them feel special and we want them to basically sell for us, right? So always, always, always in this day and age, ask for a referral if you have a happy customer. Literally be like, will you go on my Google page, my Google profile, and leave me a referral? Will you go on Yelp and leave me a referral? Will you write a referral and email it to me and I'll go put it up? You know what I mean? Kind of thing. Always get the referral. That person's word means so much more than your word about your product to their peers. Okay? So those are funnels. And this is basically what a funnel looks like when you break it down. <laughs> so this one's a little complicated, but it's a good like, template. So basically, we start with an offer, right? So something to generate that awareness or attract. And then from there, we're just creating a sequence. That's all we're doing. So look scary, this map, but really all we're doing is our entire marketing plan based upon those smart objectives, based upon those KPIs and that budget we've defined. We're creating a sequence of a guest map. So for this one, we say, oh, we're going to pull off the product service or action. And then that leads us to our first interaction, which is, does our customer already know about our 
No, they don't. Do they know who you are? No, they don't. Do they know their problem? Yes, they do. So they're not going to go down. Show them content and then return to them for follow. They try to get an answer, right? So then we go over here. Is it our offer that they're looking at? Or do they know about it? Does our offer apply? If yes, move them down, right? How much is it? So we're creating pieces of marketing material at each of these points, each of these engagement points, specifically targeting where they're at in that sequence, in that funnel, right? So if I get someone here and says, how much is it? And this is what I don't like is they kind of abandoned some of the yes and no's here. So like, have they purchased anything for me? No. Can you sell them something else first? You know, um, if, they, if they don't purchase. But so if they say no to something, I know I can hit them with the next offer. So everybody here is probably on some email list of some kind, right? Um, and you'll get these offers every day. And they'll look at it. Whether you open the email or didn't open the email, did you respond? Did you? And they will send what are called upsells and downsells, left and right, right? So, like, I've got something I want you to buy. It costs one hundred and ninety nine dollars. I know you're not going to spend that without me building some kind of credibility and authority. So, first, I'm going to offer you this thirty nine dollar product. The teaser, right? Um, it allows us to get familiar with each other. It's kind of we're going out on a date. You see, if we like each other here. Right, but if you say no to my thirty-nine dollar offer, and I have a funnel and a sequence built out, I'm just like I don't know. Like they said no, move on to the next one, I guess. Right? You know, I don't know what else to do. But if I have this built out, I'm like, oh, they said no to my thirty-nine dollar offer. So what else can they do? I have a free offer of something I can send them. So hey, you don't want to buy the ebook. Get the first chapter free. Download it now, right? And then from there, I resend them the whole like, you like that chapter? You got some value out of it? And made you some money? Spend the 39 bucks. Spend the $399. And we keep basically taking them out of the funnel and re-putting them back in. That's all this is, is like, if you imagine all this stuff back in the funnel, it's just a series of loops that say, yes, no, what do we do next? When you build your plan, that's what I want you to think about. And it can be complicated like this, or it could literally be simple as like one action item, go down. They said yes, cool. They said no, go over here, right? Um, ultimately, if they say no, we always do what we call, we put them in a drip campaign. And that's kind of what we were talking about before. We've got their information now, so now I'm just gonna start pestering you with emails occasionally, saying, hey, how's it going? You know, have you put any more thought into this? Oh, hey, I just had something come up. Did you know I'm gonna be at this show? Did you know we've got a new event or course coming up? So on and so forth. So that's how I want you guys to think about it is attention, interest, desire, action, and then ask yourself, start with a product or an offer, and then ask yourselves yes or no. Here's my product or offer. I'm doing an ad that leads to a website registration page. Did they buy? No, they didn't buy. Okay. Then why didn't they buy? Sometimes we have to do some guesswork here. You know, price is too high. So I'm going to down tell them and offer them a different product at less price. Right? Um, and then I'm going to move them into an email campaign or I'm going to retarget. The last thing I'm going to leave you with here on that is that we used to have them way back in the day in marketing, we used to have what we call rule of three, which means you have to hear a brand's name three times before you can recognize it. So the first two times you hear it, they don't, it doesn't resonate. It's Japanese. Yeah. Um, that rule, because of the overload of information we've got with the internet and everything else, um, and how much we're just inundated with advertisements and marketing messages today, we bump that up to a rule of 10. Which means if you want to do business with someone, they better see you 10 different times preferably in as many ways before they even recognize who you are. But here's what's beauty about it is when you get to that rule to that pen, it happens like magic. So I have this customer, we 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 participate in this group of um it's actually new top business owners, but we participate in this group that's why new top business owners that has like 45,000 members. 
um, in this Facebook group, right? And we post there, so we comment on people's posts, we're asking for information, uh, you know, we comment if people are actually looking for a marketing agency, and occasionally we'll just post content there that's ours, like a short video on, you know, how to do this, or how to do that, how to set up your, how to set up your Google Google profile, or things like that, right? We post there all the time, and occasionally I have people who will refer us, who will say like, oh, hey, we just work with CWG and they did a great job inside of this group. I had somebody who was looking for a marketing agency, we reached out to him, we got a meeting, a pitch meeting set up with them, and we're talking to him. And I'm giving him the, you know, who we are, our background, why we're experts in our field thing. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I know you guys. I've seen you before. I don't think we've worked together, but I've seen you before, I know you. Never met this guy. I have no idea who he is. Product brand new, right? And he's like, oh yeah, 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 no, no, we're familiar with you. We're familiar with you. I don't do much. Like I don't do much in Utah. I don't do a lot of these things. I definitely am not like a sponsor of the Jazz or anything like that, right? So the only way this guy knew me and had like instant branding, recognition, and connectivity is just he'd seen so many of our posts that all of a sudden we went from being some marketing agency who's trying to earn our business somehow to a, a household thing to do. He was like, yeah, I know you guys. I know CWG. You guys are good. You're good at what you do. Cool, thanks. Made my job a lot easier to close that account, right? So that's the rule of man in action. Like, if you can get somebody to see you 10 times, you legitimize your business in their eyes. So any way you can do that, that's, that's email, that's social advertisements, that's in person, that's whatever, but you've got to get interactions with them, even if they don't remember that. Yeah. Um, we already talked about KPIs, so I'm not going to do that because we already went over that. Um, last thing, we kind of have a method. We call it how method. I'll quickly tell you about that. It just stands for test, analyze, optimize. So it's kind of our method in-house to CWG of saying like, hey, marketing is never done, and it's not something, definitely not something you set and forget right? Um, so you treat marketing like day trading and not like your 401k. Like once you put that money in, you check on it, you follow up on it, you nurture it, right? Um, and make sure it's, it's happening. So to do that, we use a method called TAL, stands for Test, Analyze, Optimize, which just means every time we build a marketing campaign, we try to run some kind of test inside of that campaign. Usually that's called what's called an AB split test, meaning we change something about an ad that goes out and we send out two versions with a small percentage of the budget first, right? It could be we change the headline, it could be we change the color of the button, you know what I mean? And cast whether an orange button or a green button is gonna work better here. Um, but we test two, we only change one variable throughout the entire app. So you start changing all the variables, you have no idea what, what, what it was, right? That, that worked, but we set a small percentage of our budget into running this AB split test first. Then we take a look at the results and we take the one, the winner, the one that did better, right? And that's when we dump the rest of the budget. So that's test. Go ahead. Uh, it happens all the time. Like, it could literally be a word, it could be a font size, it could be a picture, it could be a color. So there's a big thing with color psychology and marketing. I'm so far over time, I'm not going to go into that stuff. But you can look it up, but like different colors emote different feelings from us, right? So just a quick example, red, red is used as a warning. So red is stop signs are red for a reason, right? Almost worldwide. So like when you use red in a marketing piece, you are subconsciously telling somebody, stop, don't go past this point, which is great if I want to use that inside a copy somewhere to really relay a special point, right? I want my, my value proposition in red and bold because they're gonna stop reading right there and be like, oh, this is important, like whatever it is. But if I use red in a button, that may cost me some sales because I'm subconsciously telling somebody, don't click. Like warning, this is bad, right? So that, that could go a color, be the difference between success the campaign and not, yeah. So yeah, I, I kind of said this in the beginning. So our our company color is kind of like 
uh, Apple green, you know, kind of a candy apple green. This projector is not synced up to my monitor's color calibration very well, so we've got this really horrible highlighter yellow green, which I mean, I guess it's easy to see, which is good. It's sort of offensive. <laughs> But yeah, so we can screen because green's our color, right? So if you were to walk into my office, uh, which is over there on Center Street, like you walk into our, our lobby area and like one of our walls is literally our color green, as close as I can do to make the match, you know, with our tag right green the line. Um, because I don't want people when they see that color of that kind of that apple green, that sort of light green color, and they're like they want I want them to think of our green. So it's like color gold is gold gold red, right? And they use what's called the Anton color. Um, Anton is just a way to tell every printer in the world exactly the color of something. So I have suggest you all set up what's called a brand style guide, which is a series of like these are my colors, this is my logo, these are the font types I use throughout everything. So that way you're not like your brand's consistent and people start to recognize it, right? And I'll talk to and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, I know you. Change something every time you deliver it, it's useful and that's not. But that's why Coca Cola is Coca Cola Red. And Coca Cola covers that thing insanely well. Like the formula. Yeah, it's like their formula, but they like art that. Like, if you work with Coca Cola as an advertiser or marketing, you have to give them physical samples before you can print billboards or whatever so that they can make sure that you have their red exactly right because they don't want. 30 shades of red, for example, in one single color. So when you see that can soda in that color, you're like, that's like, oh man, I'm thirsty. Yeah. So, if I was to go to a business, could you go and that other sort of hub, maybe? So, like, if you go to that other sort of hub, Yeah, I know. So, you're on the here because. I am here because my perception is a little bit different than a lot of people's people, I guess, outside of some of your focus. Um, so, like, my goal is, hey, hey, we want you guys to know we're here and we want to be, like, part of the community and better the community in any way, shape, or form. And so, like, we want, like, my wife's in the board with Chandler Clark, we sponsor Chandler Clark's events, we sponsor some of the youth club and the hospital and that kind of stuff, um, just because, hey, I want to be a good citizen and a good neighbor. Um, B, I fully believe on our students in that development, right? So, like, this ruffles some other phone apps, so maybe it should be set offline, not in this meeting. But, like, I believe that oil, coal, and cattle is not the future for what I mean. I believe they're all dying industries, they're important industries, but they're all dying industries that have peaked and they're all on down slopes. So, and, like, Wyoming and Edison specifically is going to grow up, and we're going to be wealthy and rich and sustainable and have a bright future ahead of us, we have to have new industries and new innovative ideas come into play and take root in our community, right? And that's what you guys are bringing to the table. And so I want to support that any way I can as best I can. So that's why I'm here doing this. I don't want to really pitch my business. But on that note, yeah, so if you want to talk more in depth about your idea and have a little marketing plan of scope in. Hey, call me and I will we'll set up something. I'll talk to you and we'll go through like we'll spend an hour, hour and a half together, no charge. And I will talk to you. This goes for anyone in this room. I will sit down with you and talk to you and answer your questions and help you max some of this stuff out. I'm happy to do that, right? B, if you want to hire a marketing agency, that's part of what you dedicate your budget to. Or have an idea of what you want to do. If you want to hire a marketing agency, it's all because you're like, this stuff's either. Yeah, I mean, it's not over anybody's head because you know, I'm not the smartest person in this room by far, I guarantee it. But there's that saying, like, we're on our business, not in our business, right? So, like, I got other things I got to spend my time doing. I can't spend my time studying on that. Um, so, I can hire somebody. Like, I love, you know, on that. So, either way, you're going to get my contact information in just a second. Um, I'm here. That's your question? Okay, cool, fair. I'm a good guy, right? Um, all right. Uh, let's see, all right. So anyway, that, that was yes. analyze is just we have to constantly be measuring our results, right? So
So there are a number of tools and applications out there, and I think that's probably more one-on-one -on -one conversations we don't have time for today. But things like Google Analytics and our website like that is a free tool provided by Google, but it helps us analyze our traffic. We know where they came from. Do they come from search or do they come from direct traffic? Meaning like do they click the link to get to our website that we put on like social media or you know, something to share with that kind of or we know if they come from search or they come from direct traffic. What search they came from, what page they landed on. How many things do they navigate on our website before they left our site? Right? Well, where do they go? They went from my home page straight to my pricing page. Which means like they literally jump in that funnel from awareness all the way down to action almost, right? So like that's good, that's a short sales cycle, but did they lie, did they not lie? Like analytics can tell us all that kind of information, right? We can read that. Our social media accounts, same thing. Meta business, you should have meta business, if you have a business page, and meta business will literally tell you your engagement, the number of floors, it will tell you the day of the time that your audience is engaging with your content levels. I, I know that information. I know the Thursday night at 6 p.m., we had 1,972 views. But on Sunday at 1, I got 200. Like, why don't we have to play that stuff out there? Thursday night, right? That's one of my best offers going on, that one, that kind of stuff. So, like, there are tools out there to analyze all of this. Use that. Again, don't set it and forget it. Don't create it like a 401k. Like this is day trading. This is this is I'm constantly interacting with my marketing campaigns to make sure they're better. And that leads us to the last time I'm stopping this. Which means there's a change to be made, we're gonna change it. Right? A lot of people don't like to do that. A lot of marketing experts like me will literally say, don't change anything today until we're done. And it's true, there's too much tinkering that can happen where people are constantly trying to change things and we can't get good data of changing too often. Well, if we see red flags, like I was saying, if I'm spending money to deliver an ad or I sent out 500 postcards and I didn't get a single call out of that, why the hell would I spend the next chunk of money doing it all over again when I can do something else and I can work about it, right? Like, adapt, pivot, adjust. So that's our talent. Definitely, I would say use it, you know what I mean? Um, adopt it into your own a marketing plan, it will definitely help you guys to maximize your return on investment and maybe your cost for acquisitions of CPAs you calculated lower and lower and lower. If you're purposely optimizing, you can get your CPA down real nice and friendly, you know? So it makes start out really high where you're like, man, we got some a lot of money. Now we know what we need to say to them, right? We know when we need to say it to them, all that kind of stuff. Now I can start to dial that in and dial that in. And with that, my cost per acquisition goes down and down because I don't have to send them as many offers, as many messages, display as many ads, be on as many channels because I can communicate directly with you and whisper in here exactly what you want to hear. So that's a good one. Okay, so this QR code right here is a V card. So if you scan that with your phone, it will literally put my personal contact information into your phone. So if you want to call me and harass me and bug me, you got my office line, you got my cell line. I normally don't say this, but right now don't call my office line because no one can find the phone for the past four days. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we use a cell phone for our office line and I don't know who did what with it and it's dead at this point, but no one can find it. So I think I have to order a whole new SIM card and put it in a different phone. Um, so that's just gonna go to voicemail and then we'll have to check and call you back. Unfortunately for me, my cell's attached to my hip 24 hours a day. Um, you know, so you can get a hold of me. But just please don't try to call me like late after hours or anything like that. Um, but yeah, so that'll, that'll give you my V card. So if you want to, uh, you know, put me into your phone or whatever, contact me, you can. If not, our company is CWG. We've got a Google page up, has our address and everything, but we're over there at 913 Center Street, uh, right behind. Uh, the uh, Blyden Fargo building um, and the old bank and stuff next to Century Link. So we're there um, in the bottom floor. Um, so come down and see us, you know. Um, I'd love to I'd love to learn more about each of your businesses. Uh, like I said, answer any questions, be here as a resource if you need anything. Um, definitely download those worksheets and do them. 
uh, if you need hard copies uh, from me. Like I said, I've got a couple with me today, and I'm more than happy to print off. Plenty more after I either convince my printer that we're friends and it can cooperate, or I smash it and replace it. We're going to see what happens tomorrow. So you can stay tuned to find that one out, too. Um, and otherwise, you can follow us on social media if you want. We uh, try to put out a lot of helpful content on there as well. So short form videos and all kinds of stuff to just give you tips, tricks, updates. What's going on with us? Cool. All right, guys, I appreciate it. I know we went way, way long. I apologize. Rafa, you had to know what you were getting into, though, when you asked me. No, I go on and on. Any questions that we haven't already gone over? Anybody want any help with anything personal? Come see me. Yeah.